Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you may be in the world. My name is Sophia Arend, and I'm the Global Blockchain Business Council's Communications and Content Lead. We are so pleased to have you all join us for the GBBC's Post-Trade Distributed Ledger Group's webinar on Unpacking DeFi for Institutions. Just briefly before we begin, I'd like to provide some background on the PTDL Group. So the PTDL Group um, under, under the GBBC serves as the rallying point for prominent financial institutions and market infrastructure players whose shared vision of realizing the full potential of distributed ledger technology has brought them together. We'd also like to thank the PTDL's group's organizing committee, which is made up of representatives from BTG Pactual, CLS Bank International, the London Stock Exchange Group, Norton Rose Fulbright, State Street, Six Digital Exchange, and the Global Blockchain Business Council for organizing today's webinar and making it available to the broader finance and blockchain communities. We will also be taking questions today during the webinar, so you can submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and our moderators will take them. Um, I will now hand things over to Richard and Sean to introduce themselves and kick us off. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Shabir, and uh, welcome to the panel. Um, before we start, I'd just like to introduce you to uh, my co-moderator, Sean Murphy, um, partner and global head of FinTech at Norton Rose Fulbright. Hey, Sean. Hello. <laughs> Cool. And uh, before we get into the weeds, we're not going to, I'm not going to try and do any sort of uh, uh, introduction to DeFi. I think it's, it's a much better idea just to crack on. Uh, we've only got an hour and there's probably a fair amount we'd like to cover. So um, without further ado, let's introduce our panelists and find out their involvement in DeFi. So first of all, let's start with uh, Marta. Um, it, Marta Belcher from Protocol Labs and Ropes and Gray uh, with two hats. Um, perhaps you could uh, introduce yourself and give us an idea of your involvement with um, DeFi at the moment. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I do have multiple hats. Uh, I'm Marta Belcher. Uh, I'm the general counsel of Protocol Labs. I'm also an attorney at Ropes and Gray, and I am special counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, most of my involvement with DeFi has involved my work uh, with EFF on civil liberties uh, issues. Okay, so next up is uh, Pietro Grassano uh, from Algorand. Pietro, would you like to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about Algorand and what your sort of connection and interest in DeFi is? Absolutely. Uh, Pietro Grassano, I take care of uh, the business solutions uh, in Europe uh, for uh, the uh, blockchain Algorand. Algorand is uh, a, a blockchain protocol founded by Professor Silvio Michali. And uh, uh, we think that we have uh, created uh, an infrastructure that can uh, represent uh, a decentralized and scalable form uh, of infrastructure for uh, the economic exchange. And uh, we have uh, plenty of initiatives, uh, be it uh, in traditional finance, uh, be it uh, with institutions, be it with new businesses that use the uh, blockchain as an infrastructure for their own business models that are morphing through time. Cool, thank you. Um, and moving on to our last panelist, uh, Daniel Pellet from Orbs and Hexa Foundation. Can you give the audience an idea of, of sort of who you are and what Orbs are and uh, your involvement, please? Sure, um, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me to the panel. Orbs is a public permissionless blockchain for uh, enterprises. Um, we launched in 2018 and working with some top 500 companies in the world. Uh, we also received the Cool Garner Award uh, for the technology and some of the innovation we're building. And Hexa um, is a very active uh, investment arm, investing across the different uh, categories in blockchain. And uh, we started investing in 2013 and today we are very actively um, participating in different DeFi protocols and the opportunities that they create and we can discuss it. Brilliant. Okay, well, let, let's start with uh, the, the big picture question. Um, so maybe Pietro, um, can you tell the audience what DeFi is and how it differs from traditional finance, including uh, some, I suppose you could call them traditional crypto companies? Yeah, uh, the centralized finance uh, essentially uh, is about uh, the fact that uh, some of the financial transactions can happen uh, without uh, necessarily a centralizing, but through a, an infrastructure technology that allows uh, the avoidance of double spending by design. Such technology is called blockchain. So 
Uh, on that, uh, you can think of situations where you exchange uh, uh, financial value, and then we should also define what financial value actually is. I have a quite succinct uh, uh, definition, which is uh, finance is anticipation of future value, full stop. Okay, and so we could probably elaborate a little bit around that. Uh, this exchange can happen uh, without uh, necessarily a centralizer in many situations of our life, uh, also before the blockchain. Think about uh, the whole economy of donations that uh, can happen without a centralizer and represent as of today around 5% uh, of the global GDP. It's still a monetary value that moves around uh, without necessarily a centralizer. Uh, you can think of situations like uh, uh, exchange of uh, credits. Uh, in all the jurisdictions that I know, the fact of uh, selling a credit uh, is uh, a matter between parties. It doesn't require necessarily a centralizer. And therefore, this can happen within uh, a uh, framework that avoids double spending by design uh, with a certain ease. And uh, on top of this, uh, of course, uh, you can think of uh, other digital representations of more traditional assets that often need a centralizer. Uh, it's the case of equities, uh, it's the case of uh, mutual funds, uh, it's the case of uh, other uh, types of, uh, of assets uh, that still can be and are already today exchanged through uh, centralizers in terms of function, but that could uh, still be exchanged on a decentralized infrastructure where the centralizer still plays a role. It's not because uh, the system of the motorways is decentralized that it prevents uh, the police cars to run quickly and try to seize the thieves, right? So let's separate a little bit the function from uh, the infrastructure and we will get a, a sort of idea of what uh, the potential of decentralized finance is. Okay, and, and Marta and Daniel, is there anything that you'd like to add to that definition? And perhaps also, do you want to talk about what some of the advantages uh, of DeFi are relative to traditional finance? Sure, so I think it would be great to give some context. If we try to narrow down uh, what a blockchain is, Essentially, you're able to store data and also do uh, computational tasks on that data, um, which is very similar um, to what uh, you can do on Amazon and Google Cloud and, um, and uh, Azure, for example. So if we think what happened a couple of years ago in 2017, um, the community um, took this new database and tried to apply it to everything, to almost any use case. Um, the thought process was that any economy can now become peer-to-peer -peer economy without the middleman. So we saw projects try to do decentralized Uber and a decentralized Airbnb and a decentralized eBay and many different use cases and a lot of innovation. I think that there was a lot of realization through 2018 and 2019 um, that some of these use cases are perhaps difficult um, maybe the technology is a bit uh, too immature, but I will just give one example, just from a cost perspective, to store data on top of Ethereum today is about 10,000 times more expensive than to store data on top of Amazon. So if you are a CEO or a CFO of a company and you think, should I apply what I'm doing or part of my business on top of a blockchain, you need the use case to be 10,000 times X, 1,000 times X, or even 10X. You should do a startup just on 10X. So a lot of these use cases, I think, were a little bit um, problematic uh, while using the technology that is available um, today. Um, but shifting forward to 2020, I think uh, DeFi shifting from the concept of dApps, decentralized application, into decentralized financial applications I think the ecosystem actually uh, matured, evolved, and there is a better product market fit. Because if there is a use case that I'm willing to pay more to store data, it's where it really counts. And financial use cases, I think are a great fit. 
Because if you're giving a loan or if there is a collateral or if there is an insurance, you wanna make sure that the other counterparty actually follows through uh, with their promise, with the guarantee. And this is exactly what blockchain and smart contracts um, can enable. Um, so I think uh, this is a great advantage. I don't need to trust the counterparty from a legal perspective. I can just verify the code uh, and that what transaction we created uh, will happen. I would add to that, um, you know, I think that actually in the original Ethereum white paper, uh, decentralized finance was one of the one of the use cases that was highlighted um, for the for the potential of smart contracts. And it's really potentially powerful to be able to have peer to peer transactions online uh, without having to go through any central intermediary um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is it can be done anonymously. So you can take the civil liberties benefits of being able to make anonymous transactions like you would with cash um, and be able to actually have those transactions happen online without an intermediary. Um, you typically can't make financial transactions without uh, giving a, you know, a central institution enough information about yourself for them to know everything about everything. And I think there are a lot of really important things to be said about financial privacy. Obviously, this is very complicated from a legal and regulatory perspective, but just leaving those issues aside, um, I think those are some pretty potentially powerful reasons um, that DeFi uh, has really taken off. Thank you. That's, um, yeah, that uh, non anonymity point, I think, is something we're probably going to return to, I think, a little bit later. Um, because uh, it has a number of implications, obviously. I mean, I just you just mentioned there, um, uh, Daniel, that um, a couple of things uh, like the lending, uh, potentially insurance. But I wondered if is it possible to give because um, some of the people listening may not necessarily know the range of applications. Sort of give them a sense of of the type of applications that are out there, and it seems to be endless at the moment. <laughs> sure. Um, well, yeah. Um. So um, just to try to put some numbers, um, as of today, there's about $14 billion locked in different DeFi protocols. Uh, protocols exist in a variety of different areas. Uh, there is lending through protocols such as Compound, uh, decentralized exchanges and liquidity such as Uniswap. Also a big space that is growing rapidly is synthetic assets through protocols like Synthetics. Um, there are insurance uh, through projects such as uh, Nexus. And uh, of course, uh, a big area that is growing is uh, decentralized uh, governance of how do you build a project in a community-based manner and from a governance perspective. Um, Uniswap is a great example. Um, it's a small team um, based in New York. I think about 10 people. Uh, the whole project started as a hackathon and uh, today, on a monthly basis, they do about the same uh, trading volume as Coinbase, which is a very well-funded VC uh, a company um, with over a thousand employees. So I think it just shows the strength of how this technology can apply to really make, a, for example, liquidity in trading accessible uh, to everybody. Um, but obviously, there are many other successful examples. That, that probably also, again, goes back to that sort of anonymity point and, you know, potentially why you're seeing those type of volumes coming through. But just on the, the number of applications, I didn't know if um, Pietro or Marta, if you've come across any others in addition to what Daniel said. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, we have situations where you have, uh, um, in a very traceable manner, because pseudo-anonymity, which is the real name of the game when it comes to blockchain. It's not anonymity per se. It means that you cannot uh, find the home address of the owner, but you can trace all transactions. Allows, for instance, uh, an Italian company, also a US one, by the way, to uh, securitize pari passu on blockchain uh, what they are doing on the usual uh, uh, let me say, uh, paper kind of process in terms of securitization. Securitization is not a process that is invented by blockchain or needs blockchain per se, but this company based in Rome is actually 
uh, mirroring what they do uh, in their paper process uh, through blockchain when they do securitize account receivables towards the public administration in order to allow investors to have a better, uh, let me say, tamper proof uh, reassurance of the various layers of uh, asset they, uh, they are investing into and therefore allowing the investors to have a better risk management when they create their own portfolio. And this does not imply the fact that there is any kind of uh, hidden something that we don't understand. On the opposite, it's a way to give more uh, transparency to a market that uh, through time had its moments of opacity. Okay, go ahead, Marcel. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add just in, in terms of DeFi applications, the, the sort of whole uh, ethos behind DeFi is the ability to write computer programs that allow you to do things with money directly um, gives rise to the ability to replace central institutions. So for example, you know, there are multiple ways to do a loan. One way is to have a bank go and see whether, you know, you're, you're, you're good for it and, and ha have, a, uh, uh, have a, a, a process that involves a lot of data and information, you also could just write a computer program um, that will administrate all that for you and that requires um, collateral in the form of uh, cryptocurrency that where, where these transactions can happen automatically. And, and that's sort of, I think, the, the fundamental idea behind these DeFi applications. Okay, so j just to round out the sort of the big picture, the sort of sense of what DeFi is, um, and I'll probably open this up to all the panelists. Are you able to give us a sense of who the typical participants in the DeFi market are at the moment? And I'm, I'm asking that question, thinking in particular of the audience on this call, a lot of them will be from big financial institutions. So I'm interested in whether any of you have a view on sort of whether any financial institutions are starting to participate in the DeFi market. Who starts? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the, uh, most of the participants uh, today are um, early adopters. Uh, I think they are very crypto native. Uh, I, I think it's not very easy to participate in uh, the existing DeFi infrastructure today from a user experience perspective and also taking into account uh, the different risks involved. So I think what is driving a lot of the growth, which is being explosive over the last few months um, is actually the opportunity to generate yield on your crypto assets. So take example myself or others, um, anybody that has Bitcoin today, I think a lot of them see it as a, um, a store value, a new asset class uncorrelated and to their other assets in their saving portfolio. Um, so usually they buy Bitcoin and then they put it in a safe place, in a cold storage, in a safe custody solution and so on. Now today there's an opportunity within DeFi and not just to hold the Bitcoin as a long-term investment, but also to generate yield on the fact that you have this uh, crypto asset. Um, this is something that wasn't available before. So just over the last two, three uh, months, we've seen almost $3 billion worth of BTC moved onto uh, the Ethereum network uh, as an ERC-20 WBTC token that can now participate in the different um, uh, DeFi protocols. Um, so I think the two active participants at the moment at these early stages are investors that are looking to generate extra yield on their uh, investment crypto assets and also uh, the takers and that are leveraging um, the assets that they borrow um, to do uh, even more uh, aggressive uh, uh, strategies. Um, but I must admit, everything is quite early from a regulation perspective and from standards perspective. Um, a lot of the infrastructure is being built uh, on the go. And we can see that with the different hacks and mishaps that are happening uh, in the different protocols that obviously will strengthen um, it's vertical, but it will take time. 
Uh, I would add, you know, are, are traditional financial institutions getting involved in DeFi? No. Um, and I think uh, at this point, it's it's really like being back in 2016 or 2017 um, for the ICO boom, where you're really in the Wild West from a regulatory and legal perspective. And a lot of the, what makes uh, DeFi, first of all, worthwhile and so powerful, and second of all, a lot of the um, potential legal arguments surrounding DeFi are based on the fact that it's decentralized um, and that you don't have central institutions that can, you know, potentially uh, be heavily regulated. And so, so, so at this point, no, uh, not a lot of use cases or applications for, um, for central institutions. I will give a slightly different perspective from, from continental Europe, uh, where, by the way, there is a, a strong regulatory uh, wave. There is this uh, draft of directive uh, called uh, Market Infrastructure in Crypto Asset, MICA, that is now being uh, proposed uh, to the European Parliament. And uh, that actually, albeit, uh, in my humble opinion, non-perfect, is anyway out for consultation and for um, I mean, trying to, 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 to gather as well uh, the uh, private market participants' uh, uh, feedback. And interestingly enough, uh, the traditional uh, uh, European financial uh, uh, sector is participating to the answer back on uh, uh, Mika uh, with interesting logic. Um, Mika concerns uh, what is not. Uh, a security token which falls under the MIFID regulation in, uh, in, in the European Union and uh, what is not a currency token which falls into the e-money regulation. Uh, so essentially it covers uh, utility tokens. And uh, uh, actually you find situations in which uh, uh, traditional uh, banks, uh, the, the, the Italian banking system, for instance, has been pretty um, active uh, in uh, uh, trying to use the decentralized infrastructure in order to perform centralized functions. I mean, there is a logic for, there is anti-money laundering out there. There is a logic for regulation exists. Okay, you accept it, you don't. Okay, you don't. Fine, you accept it. Then it doesn't mean that you cannot perform the same kind of scrutinies and tracing that you can have uh, uh, with the centralized infrastructure using instead a decentralized infrastructure, uh, which is uh, in itself uh, a an added value. Uh, I mean, just think of how uh, the um, lack of traceability of some securitized products actually ended up in the 2007-2008 uh, crisis. Some of us were there, right? And uh, uh, actually, the fact of uh, having a very strong counterparty risk was also related to the fact that no regulator had any idea of what was in the balance sheet of the various actors in the market. The fact of having somehow a way to trace the evolution of specific assets, so to have an identity layer in the same infrastructure can enforce much better systemic regulation. I think that's a really interesting point, actually. Um, I haven't heard someone link it back to 2007, 2008 before, but uh, we all remember what that was like. Or that, uh, Certainly, uh, yeah, I mean, um, there, there were some uh, <laughs> some uh, uh, secu securities that uh, actually became somehow uh, non-performing, right? Hmm. And uh, the fact that those non-performing securities were in the balance sheet of Bank A or Bank B mm -hmm. actually would have created a situation, has created a situation in which the counterparty risk was felt so high and there was no central uh, regulator able to, say, to, to scrutinize and discriminate uh, that uh, the, 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 the contagion effect was too strong, yeah. right? And in, so, and in some cases, they didn't, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say in some cases as well, they didn't even know that they were in, on their balance sheet because they were wrapped up in other exactly. um, products. So, and, and this um, is a loss of traceability, right? Mm -hmm. 
So that's exactly what you want to avoid. And it doesn't yeah. imply necessarily the fact that you have to play with personal data of uh, who's actually acting. Uh, uh, so there, there is a systemic risk and it has to be managed with a systemic uh, kind of, uh, of argument. I think that actually that leads us quite nicely into the next question in terms of, um, you know, obviously we, we're going to get to the, the, the sort of uh, the bad part of it, not the bad part of it, but the, the, the unregulated part of it. Um, but in terms of opportunities, what are the real, what do you see as the real opportunities for financial institutions? And again, as Sean had mentioned, a lot of um, our participants are from those institutions. I mean, uh, uh, there sounds like there could be some good tech underneath there or, or some real opportunities for financial institutions to make things better for themselves. Um, I don't know, should we uh, start with Daniel? Um, sure. So I think um, at least at this early stage, I see a lot of the opportunity in, in the wealth creation uh, for financial institutions uh, and for their customers and also on the retail side. If I'll give just one example, um, today um, some people don't own Bitcoin or Ethereum because of the volatility. And, but if we think about it, uh, they have exposure to uh, US dollar, they earn salary in, in dollars. And today holding these dollars in a bank account, um, you don't receive anything. It's about 0.25% annual yield. And if you take these dollars and you convert them to, for example, USDC, which is a fully collateralized, collateralized um, regulated um, um, crypto dollar, um, you can earn between eight to 12% yield on this USDC. I think even Circle now is in the process to potentially offer um, 8% to all of their customers that bank the USDC uh, with them. Um, so I think this is actually can really help uh, everybody uh, generate yield and wealth creation on their existing capital. And I think today, uh, more than ever, people need to think how they're actively managing their saving because having a saving is just not enough. You know, more than 20% of all the money in the world has been printed in the six months alone. And people think there's no inflation in the world because they go to the marketplace and it's the same uh, prices, but we can see the inflation where there is scarce assets in Bitcoin, in real estate, in the equity markets. Um, so I definitely think people uh, need to be aware what is happening on a macro level and potentially educate themselves. So how can they can uh, stay competitive um, to being passive? Okay, so we're getting some great questions on the uh, on the Q and A system. So I'm gonna I'm gonna direct one to um, Pietro, and then there are a couple that I'll I'll throw to Daniel and Marta. So um, Pietro, do you want to answer Tony's question about Mika yep. and uh, the the requirement that there be identifiable companies or persons? Absolutely, uh, no problem in having uh, identifiable addresses and. Uh, uh, bells to ring to when things get sour. I think it's a part of a sound marketplace, a marketplace where you don't have an actual counterpart. It can be particularly complex, which doesn't prevent the transaction to happen without the centralizer with uh, uh, known addresses. If we do exchange a credit between uh, Sean uh, and myself, uh, we have addresses, but still we don't need a centralizer. And, and do you yeah, think that the different thing is, uh, uh, I mean, I come from uh, the asset management industry, right? The logics of uh, yield seeking uh, kind of investment uh, are offered on a no name basis. Well, I'm not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But this is my stance. And uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the kind of, uh, of logic I, uh, I live into and I do not pretend to necessarily extend it to everybody else. So okay. Tony is right, uh, there is a requirement for uh, uh, legal entities to exist or uh, addressable uh, counterparties to exist, which doesn't prevent the utilization of the decentralized infrastructure. Okay. Um, so I'll, th there are two other questions which I'll, I'll throw out to Daniel and Marta. Uh, one of them is uh, how ETH 2.0 will affect DeFi. Uh, and the other was, uh, this one is from Mark asking if we could talk through, does it, can anyone talk about microfinance loaning mechanisms with DeFi? Sure, so I think um, uh, ETH 
2.0 will have a, a dramatic effect on DeFi. Um, one of the uh, biggest um, hurdles uh, with the existing infrastructure uh, with Ethereum is that um, there's low transaction throughput and the fee to store data is expensive. Um, so if 2.0 will improve that, we see that uh, when there are interesting opportunities within the DeFi ecosystem, and um, actually the network gets congested and uh, the fee and the gas can go very, very uh, high. Um, so that will help reduce that. Right now there are different um, protocols that help solve these issues. Uh, Algorand, for example, does that uh, very well, but still most of the ecosystem is on top of Ethereum and ETH 2.0 will solve some of these bottlenecks. I know also some of the biggest projects in the industry um, are already um, building things uh, on top of optimism and, and collaborating with the ETH 2.0 team. So I think we will see a lot of innovation as the rollout happens. What, what impact will ETH 2.0 have on the cost of storage on Ethereum or will, or will it be neutral? I, I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, probably uh, Vlad or Vitalik are a better chance of that. I'm not technical. I apologize. Uh, but, but I think it will be uh, quite dramatic uh, in a scale of uh, a tenth of the cost today. Obviously, it will get also congested because people need to understand is that the way DeFi works, because it's a completely decentralized system, it's a system of incentives. And uh, things happen because there are different incentives for different participants um, to do their part. Um, from a financial perspective. Um, so just one example why a, a potential network can become congested is because of bots that are running on top of Ethereum today. All the information is public. They're monitoring the mempool. And if they see an opportunity, they always shoot transactions um, to try to uh, front run, for example, uh, which is happening on chain. Um, so if you need to do a dramatic increase in transaction throughput, and uh, lowering uh, uh, the fee cost in order for DeFi to scale on a global level. Uh, but obviously everything is still uh, early on. Um, so um, with the growth of the DeFi vertical, I think that the protocol will grow also. Um, I'm happy to take the, the other question, the loans question. Um, so typically when you, know, you have a crypto asset and it's sitting in your crypto wallet, you're obviously not getting interest on it, though it may in fact go up in value relative to other assets. And so the idea here is there are these lending pools um, that effectively, I mean, operate as com computerized uh, lending offices of, of banks. Um, basically you can lend out your crypto and earn interest on that loan. Uh, and this is all happening automatically through a computer program. Um, and uh, again, this is a this is a smart contract application that doesn't involve any sort of uh, uh, giving of your data in order to you know make sure that it's a good loan. Rather, you actually have to uh, put up collateral, um, and that will you know all of this happens again automatically um, through an algorithm. And the one thing um, on your question earlier about whether um, you know, how, how traditional uh, financial institutions are utilizing this um, or can utilize this. I, I think a lot of this technology is really interesting and should be really interesting for traditional financial institutions, similar to how sort of traditional cryptocurrency, I can't believe that we're using the term traditional cryptocurrency, but here we are, um, was not necessarily interesting, you know, just, it, it, cryptocurrency qua cryptocurrency, but rather the uh, technology turns out to be really useful on the back end of some, some banking platforms. And so this type of technology could actually make financial institutions more efficient on the back end, similar to how you saw, you know, JPM coin, for example, using, using a blockchain. Um, and, and arguably, I mean, I would argue, um, it, you know, while this technology is really interesting to uh, financial, traditional financial institutions, if a traditional financial institution is engaging in um, these types of activities, it is by definition not DeFi. <laughs> is it what is that? I mean, I've, I heard one panel the other day uh, talk about DeFi as, as more of a tech. It's a, de a de decentralized tech. So, I mean, would that fit into your description if, if, a, if one of these financial institutions uh, and exchange decided to use this technology and put regulated instruments on there? I mean, that would effectively still be DeFi, wouldn't it? 
Well, I mean, the, the, the whole point of DeFi, right, is these peer-to-peer -peer transactions that is decentralized, that it's not going through, it's decentralized finance, right? It's not going through um, a centralized intermediary. And, and truly the peer-to-peer -peer technology, I think, could be, I suppose, deployed, but the mm -hmm. technology itself, if it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, um, right, is not DeFi technology. What if one of the peers was a bank? A bank that collects your data? A bank that, uh, for instance, uh, remunerates you for the data she lets you from. Sure. So I, mean, so, I mean, then you get into the very interesting legal and regulatory landscape around whether traditional institutions can use DeFi tools um, <laughs> and technologies from a legal and regulatory perspective, um, which is, I'm sure, a whole other topic in this, uh, in this panel. Which I think probably brings me to that question, actually. But um, uh, I just had to ask that question because that that, that's an interesting thought that, you know, it can't be DeFi. Whereas I think um, I think potentially like exchanges and things could use this and just let, allow their clients to, to trade, for instance, on a DEX, um, potentially using that technology. Um, and similarly, a pool of bank clients could effectively have their own um, you know, loans, with a loan book of, of different loans, flash loans coming in and out. It would be good, really interesting, but again, so that leads us into this sort of uh, regulatory question of, of um, how it fits into the existing landscape and um, um, how, what they need to do. I mean, for financial institutions on the call, you know, does it fit into any traditional landscape, I guess? Um, let's start with you, you Pietro. But, uh, listen, uh, an example is uh, the fact that you can use uh, the centralized infrastructure to have a much better process of uh, banking reconciliation. That's what uh, the Italian Banking Association has been doing, okay, and has been somehow vocal about. My take is that it's not been a huge technological success, but it's been a good success in terms of collaboration, right? And uh, uh, you can think of the centralization not in a digital manner from zero to 100, there might be situations, I mean, it's like private and public, right? We articulate our public persona with a private one daily, many times. We move from being public to being, uh, uh, to being private. And it's also, when it comes to centralization, the centralization, there are, uh, there are uh, reasons for, there are some centralized functions. There are reasons for, there are some middlemen as well. The, the important thing is that in a world in which uh, I think the, the statistic coming out from a McKinsey study was 95% of the millennials has zero trust in centralized institutions, 95%, right? The native digital and so on and so forth. We try to understand why it is the case. And instead of uh, putting all the pressure on those that try to say, okay, maybe we don't need a middleman. Well, the discussion should be somehow uh, switched into the middleman needs to show its added value. Otherwise, there is no point in having a middleman. Well, uh, that's a little bit uh, the, 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 the kind of, uh, of framing that I can see in, uh, in all this. And uh, this is happening actually. So there are, uh, in a slightly different environment, the one of identities, uh, of digital identities. Some of the providers of digital identities that are historically centralized providers of digital identities, issuers and verifiers, are somehow moving towards a progressively more decentralized way, the self-sovereign identity kind of framework, which then can be beneficial as well to the financial industry. Right, and I see the same kind of process happening uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, even central banks, which have central in the name, are starting to consider using the centralized infrastructure. Um, I was going to go sort of and sort of talk about some of the challenges of, of um, DeFi. Um, so, so one of them, I'd like to come back to something Daniel said um, towards the beginning about the sort of the difficulty 
of engaging with DeFi and using DeFi. Can you just give the audience a sense of the, the user experience of trying to use um, DeFi and, and why that is currently challenging? Yeah. <clears throat> so the, the way I see it is that um, DeFi and the Ethereum blockchain in, in the long term um, will really act as a, as a backend to this permissionless open um, um, uh, financial database. Uh, but there will be endpoints for mainstream users to make it more accessible without them actually needing to read it in code, to be technical at all, um, and, and just a, a much better user experience. If I give an example, even with Bitcoin, you know, there's a, a saying in the industry is that now you can become your own bank. Uh, when you own Bitcoin, if you control the private key. Um, but I'm not sure that I would recommend my parents or my grandparents to try to protect their private key, especially if it's significant amounts. Um, you know, if it's just their day-to-day -day amounts, that's okay, they can have a mobile wallet. But their lifetime saving, I, I think having a professional custodian with a very simple user experience is actually a good solution for many mainstream users. So it's a little bit what is happening in, in DeFi right now. Um, if you want to participate, you need to be technical savvy. You need to read the smart contract and understand exactly what it is, it is doing. Um, and there are less trusted parties that can act as a gateway and to access some of the features that we are discussing. Yeah. So, so picking up on some of the comments Daniel's just made, and this, this is for sort of Pietro and Marta, I mean, there was a, a lot of commentary, there's been a lot of commentary over the last few months about some of the uh, problems that have occurred in the, uh, the DeFi world. So things like scams, rug pulling, excessive pre-mined tokens, high fees. Do you want to give the audience a, a sort of a sense of, you know, what, what those challenges have been? Uh, and also talk about whether you think and sort of when and how you think those issues will be addressed by the industry. Sure. So um, I know it sounds like a lot of uh, not so good things are happening, um, but I actually want to also look at it from a different direction. Uh, we participated quite actively in 2017 and 18. More than $15 billion were invested across the industry in different projects via SAFT, Simple Future Agreement for uh, Tokens. And, and that model was also quite problematic um, from an accountability perspective and governance perspective. There's too much money, uh, very low governance. And because uh, it was drafted as everything is utility, there were no actually any ownership or any rights uh, with many of these projects. And some ended um, well and some ended not so well. Um, I think actually with DeFi, um, there is more accountability or there's more transparency because everything is in front of you in the code. You don't need to trust the team necessarily. You don't need to trust the um, legal agreements. Um, you need to be at this point technical savvy to see what the contract itself uh, is doing, which is not necessarily easy. Um, but I do think it's a much higher level of transparency and ability to control the risks. Um, on the other side, we do see a lot of things happening that are not so good. I, I think some of them, because there is still um, in the ecosystem a lot of greed, so people you know, put funds and try to create yield on, on very new protocol, very new projects um, because of the opportunity and people take advantage of that. Um, and we see very strong team and very ethical team um, that do do mistakes because there's a lot of moving parts in DeFi and, and all of the projects are interconnected and there's a lot of composability be between the different um, um, uh, aspects. And, and that creates complexity from a, a coding perspective, but also economical attacks that are, are quite new. How different people use flash loans that in one block can take an exploit in a vault strategy um, that was uh, introduced. Um, so I think uh, overall, actually the direction is good. There is more accountability, there's more governance, there is more visibility um, to what other projects are doing. Um, but it's very early on, so there are some honest mistakes that I think actually will make the industry uh, more secure and strength in the long run. And obviously there is a, 
opportunism and still lack of regulatory framework that enables people um, to do scams. Uh, but I think that will uh, very quickly um, go lower. And also, as it happens, it, it, it's less appetite to people to speculate and they move away from it. So I think this will actually end uh, in the not so uh, far future. Okay, thank you. Um, Marta and Pietro, do you want to add to any of that? And maybe perhaps you could sort of describe for the audience some of the problems that have been experienced over, over the last few months. Sure. Um, so I, I think the the, uh, the yam situation <laughs> is probably is probably the best. You, in in effectively forty eight hours, uh, you saw it, it, you saw you know the sort of rise and fall um, of a token very quickly. A lot of people lost a lot of money. Um, I would I want to add to what Daniel said about twenty seventeen. Um, so at the time, you know, we I, obviously I, there were a lot of ICOs um, that raised money directly from the public. And you know that ended up being, in many ways, problematic um, because when you have technical bugs, for example, um, or just straight up scams, um, <laughs> you um, people, a lot of people ended up losing a lot of money. I do want to disagree with one thing that Daniel said. Daniel said that the issue was um, the SAFT model. I actually think the SAFT model is was the answer, uh, not the not the the problem. The problem was people going out and raising money from the general public and people losing a lot of money. Um, the idea with the SAFT model um, is that you actually only uh, do an offering to accredited investors um, and you actually do sell something, uh, you, you actually do um, engage in securities transactions, um, but just with accredited investors. And so that allows you to raise money to go build this platform um, and, and actually build a token that's going to have some sort of utility. And you then spend some time actually going and using this money, this actual investment that you got from um, accredited investors and you and you build this token and then once that token is real once it's once it's you're actually able to use it and it's part of this it has become a decentralized network only then are members of the public actually able to to come in and buy that token um and so that is i think um a model that really was the answer to um the the issues you saw in 2017 um and what you're seeing now you're really back in in the 2017 wild wild west with DeFi. And you know, will we see uh, models like that that can come in and, and be the answer and allow for some semblance of trust in what is otherwise a trustless environment? Um, I don't know. Um, I do know right now it's, it's because a lot of uh, really what I think the main issue, at least I see it in DeFi, is, uh, is actually technical issues. Um, like you can see, you, there have been a bunch of instances where a technical issue has led to a lot of people losing a lot of money very fast. Um, I, I'm not sure that um, there will be a, a, a very quick reckoning. Um, and I don't know that it's, it's going to be a safe place for a lot of money for a while. I mean, isn't that where the, the centralized institution model potentially owning some of the DeFi technology would actually help because, um, for instance, I mean, we've been talking about trust. I mean, that figure of 95% of millennials was a little bit eye-opening. Um, but, you know, here in the UK, for instance, you put your money into a savings account. We know since the 2008, you know, you've got the financial services compensation theme see, uh, scheme, which is £80,000 of your savings is protected. So, you know, if I'm sticking my money into DeFi, I have no idea who these guys are, even if there is a team showing up on, on the About Us, no idea who they are, could disappear overnight. But if that's then owned by a centralised um, institution and potentially regulated, then surely that gives me the trust to potentially earn yield without losing my money. Is that so? So DeFi needs to come into the centralized scope. Again, I, I, I think that again, it's a continuum between what is centralized, what is not centralized. I mean, the, 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 the world is more complex than black and white. Uh, and uh, uh, at the end of the day, you can find models in which uh, let's call them banks, uh, are a, uh, a trusted third party for specific things, uh, which are not necessarily anymore the old stuff for which we were trusting them. Uh, custody, 
uh, if you have a truly atomic transaction, why do you need a custodian, right? It, but it can become something different, which is the custody or a custody strategy of the private keys. Because if I am, uh, uh, I mean, there, there can be strategies where two out of three um, owners of those private key can uh, uh, have access uh, to uh, the, the funds and uh, the bank can be one of the three. Uh, so th there can be multiple uh, uh, flavors uh, in between uh, what is uh, fully decentralized and what is fully centralized. Already today, full centralization does not exist. Right? So we know that we need agents, we need individuals, we need peers being able to represent the market overall. Daniel or Malta, anything to add on that? Um, no, I just regarding the, the SAF, I'm not sure if it exactly um, solved the problem. I think it gave more advantage to the um, accredited buyers because very um, soon after that, the secondary market opens and, and the accredited has an advantage over the retail. Um, so I'm not sure if it was a, a complete solution. I think that venture capital did um, expand in such a way that there is a lot of check and balances and governance that are not included in the staff, um, but it, it's, a, it's a different discussion. What we do see with a permissionless blockchain and, and DeFi is this open innovation that is happening and because of the permissionless nature, which I think is, is very, very interesting and the pace of things that are happening um, are, are so fast. And a lot of the things, the projects that are today leading the, the industry, I couldn't predict them um, just a couple of uh, months or years ago. Um, ERC-20 becoming a standard and, and a lot of things that happen completely by the community. I, I think this is the, the, the real strength. And, and as being mentioned, um, you can try to put DeFi in the regular boxes of their regulatory framework, because in the end, what DeFi is doing is taking existing financial transactions and, and putting them on chain. So lending and, 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 and the different uh, uh, collaterals and insurances and so on. But on the other hand, as Petra mentioned, there's a lot of middlemen and intermediaries that are not needed uh, when you build uh, this uh, transaction on top of, uh, of the blockchain. So there needs to be customizations in order to really leverage, um, I think the permissionless and the accessibility um, that this technology brings to the world. And, and I think it's, you know, this example has been given a lot of time, but it's still worth to emphasize and mention it is that there is more than 2 billion people in the world that are not connected to the financial system uh, we, we are so used to from a, uh, lending and saving and insurances um, because the amount of money they make on an annual basis um, doesn't cover the cost to operate the existing financial um, system. So, so definitely I think trying to um, put a, a DeFi ecosystem within the existing framework would be very problematic. Um, there needs to be a full process how we can open this innovation and, and not uh, and close it. So I know we're slowly, we're running out of time soon. So maybe just do try and sum up in 10 or 20 words from each panelist, the future of DeFi then. Start with Marta. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <20 words. laughs> no, I don't, I'm just I'm just thinking we've only got a little bit of time so yeah I think than, I think the yeah. future of DeFi is fundamentally tied to um, the ability for laws and regulations to allow for financial privacy and anonymous transactions and if from a legal perspective uh, we can't do that um, the future of DeFi I think is in jeopardy cool thank you Petro Petro I think that uh, there will be a, a clearer uh, understanding that we are talking about uh, a, an infrastructure. An infrastructure is made uh, of uh, the ability to solve a problem in an efficient manner, the ability to give uh, accessibility to people. Daniel mentioned the logics of uh, financial inclusion and as well the security 
And that security may come from centralized or decentralized infrastructures, depending on various elements. Let's remember we are in a digital world. So there are transactions, for instance, the transactions related uh, to the attention span on a social network. How do you remunerate them without this being completely alienated? You need something, you need a ledger, you need a record that is secure for that. So this infrastructure is gonna be the new infrastructure with the existing market participants that will change a little bit that uh, they, they are they are logics, they are apps. The important thing is that, uh, I mean, when cars, uh, combustion engine came out, you probably didn't want the horse driven chariot uh, riders to ride the regulation, right? There needs to be an ability of uh, moving from a standard to another standard in a seamless way that does not uh, regulate technology, that doesn't hinder innovation. And at the same time, that still gives the security, the accessibility and the um, efficiency in solving the problem. Okay. Um, I think that the future of DeFi is really having this uh, invisible um, back-end financial open network, leveraging the, the economy of scale um, that the blockchain uh, provides. Um, I hope it will be as similar to uh, the model of the internet that is open and permissionless, and DeFi and blockchain will do to money what the, the internet did to data. And this is the way I envision it in five, 10 years, 20 years. Sean, did you have any thoughts? Put you. Uh, I, th I think I, I have. I have. I th it's raised more questions than uh, observations. I mean, I'm going to be fascinated to see how um, regulators uh, sort of evolve their thinking about about DeFi. Um, that that's going to be fascinating to watch. Um, and I think the other thing, coming back to one of Daniel's earlier points, it's going to be very interesting to see how um, the sort of the user interfaces improve and and what can be done to. Uh, enable broader engagement safely um, with DeFi. I think for me, that would be something to watch. No, I agree. I think, um, yeah, I think it, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the technology I think is, is incredible and I'm, I'm sure centralized institutions will end up picking it up. And I think there's, personally, I think there's always gonna be a place for that. Um, uh, and also the other thing I remember is um, Daniel's uh, recommendation not to give your grandparents the keys, <laughs> private keys to uh, your custody wallet. So I'll be taking that one into consideration as well. So um, I think it's, we've got a minute left. So um, I wanted to, just, I don't think, I mean, the, the, the remaining questions are quite um, detailed. So I don't think we're gonna get time for those, but I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, to our panelists um, and, you know, for a, a great discussion and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to arrange a new one, another one in uh, 2021. And also a great deal of thanks to uh, Sean for co-moderating um, and also to, to the wider team at Norton Rose Fulbright who uh, do a huge amount of work for the PTDL. So um, we're very appreciative of that. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank um, Sophia, um, Sierra, and Polina at the, and the wider GBBC team for um, helping to put together this um, uh, panel. Um, I think uh, we're about to finish. Sophia's probably gonna round up everything, but um, the last thing I wanted to say was um, uh, happy Thanksgiving for anybody in the States. Um, and for the rest of us, we've got a full week, but we do have Black Friday to look forward to. So um, <laughs> get your credit cards out, okay. Don't forget Cyber Monday. <laughs> yes. <of course. laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And for anyone who wasn't able to tune in today, we will circulate a recording of the webinar. Thank you all. Have a good rest of Bye -bye. your week. Bye. Thank you again. Bye. Cheers. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.